football from about four until seven with the guys, mostly some guys from church. And they would meet at the middle school and came back and drank that. Even when he came back from playing ball, he wasn't feeling good, but it was very hot. That month, that summer, it got hot early. Even in May and early June, it was really hot. It, you know, and he always felt lousy. But I'm short of breath, I can't breathe. He was like, lay down, get up, and, you know, he said he couldn't breathe. So I kept saying, well, do you want me to, you know, <laughs> what, you know, do you want me to call the doctor again? Do you want, want me to take you to the hospital? What do you want me to do? And this went on for about a half an hour, I guess. And finally he said, okay, you can call the ambulance. Because he, I guess, finally started Feeling that bad. Feel, feeling bad enough, because you know how men are. They won't go for anything. So, called the ambulance, and he was showing some signs of maybe being a little bit disoriented, but he was still talking and everything, and answering the questions. The paramedics thought, kind of what I did, that he was dehydrated from throwing up so much, and that his electrolytes might have been out of whack, because they said, well, we need to get some fluid in you and get some electrolytes. and. Um, his breathing was real fast. They, you know, tried to get him to slow his respirations down. They said he was hyperventilating, and they thought that was a lot of his problem. And they put him in the ambulance and, you know, transported him. And about, after we'd gotten out of our neighborhood and into... I have your attention is five minutes to the And through the other neighborhood, we were still kind of going on the back roads, they turned the lights on, and that kind of scared me when they, because there wasn't traffic, it was, um, so we were crossing over the lake, they turned the lights on, but I called his parents in after I'd um, done all the paperwork, you know, they took him on back, but I had to give them the insurance information and everything, they eventually called me back there, and he was still conscious, but he was way incoherent. You know, he wasn't making any sense and he was real like wanting to get up off the gurney and everything and, and they finally had to give him some Ativan IV to calm him down because he wouldn't stay, you know. And what's that? Ativan is um, it's in the same family as Valium. Um, wound up putting him then in the MICU, medical intensive care unit. By the time he got up there, he wasn't really conscious anymore, but then they had pumped him full of Ativan too, so it's hard to say. You know, I don't know at what point... Really? <laughs> I'm not on so loft anymore, so... <laughs> I don't know at what point he really went into a coma, you know. And when it was the Ativan, I know that night um, I mentioned to him that he wore the extended wear lenses. And even though you sleep in those things, you know, the, the nurses don't usually like for patients to have them in. I know they make you take them out. Usually that's one of the things they ask you, and I brought it up. So they said, well, would you take his lenses out? You know, and, and he, he kind of responded to that, you know, like whenever I was trying to remove his lenses, which is really hard to do on another person. During the course of it, you know, when we were going over, you know, trying to, you know, figure out everything, I told him that he had been complaining of shortness of breath for a few weeks. About in early May, he started complaining of shortness of breath. And the first week or two of May, he had had a, a stress echo. I, I finally got him to go to our doctor, and he ordered a stress echo. And early the next morning, the doctor called and said that they'd already gotten the toxicology back, which they weren't expecting that for a long time. They said it would take, you know, a couple of days, which sounds kind of bad. And they said they'd gotten it back and they found methanol in his system. Apparently, your body doesn't metabolize methanol. 
is what they were telling me. And then I, I read up on it. As soon as they told me that's what it was, I started reading up on it too on the internet. Your body can't metabolize methanol like it does ethanol. When it, de when it tries to, it breaks down into formaldehyde and maybe some other things. But the formaldehyde is what is really bad. So what they do is to try to, the same enzyme that in your body that works on the methanol is the same enzyme that breaks down ethanol, the kind of alcohol that you drink. So the treatment is to infuse ethanol intravenously and then your body, instead of working on the methanol, it kind of leaves it alone and works on the ethanol. That gives them time to try to use dialysis and stuff to get the methanol out of your system. Well, they kept saying they weren't able to get his blood alcohol level up enough. And even though they were taking into consideration that he was a drinker, you know, apparently drinkers, you know, you can handle more alcohol. Your body works with it better. So they, you know, gave him more than what they would have a non-drinker, but they said they weren't, didn't feel like they were able to get his blood alcohol level up enough. So they, but they were doing the dialysis. Um, I think they started him on that the next, the very next day, I believe, the second day. They started him on the dialysis. But, you know, he just wasn't responding at all. He just, you know, like I said, they, you know, then they, they decided he was in a coma at some point, I guess, because after the Ativan wore off and they weren't, and he still was unresponsive. They um, did a CAT scan and said that he had suffered a major, sorry, that he had suffered a major brain bleed, <clears throat> a brain bleed, and the size and location was such that he said no one, no one could survive that, even if they were successful in getting the methanol out of his body. That because of the the bleeding in the brain, that, you know, that wasn't. So they started talking about discontinuing life support, and you know. He, we talked about it. Um, that was on that Wednesday, and you know, they kept assuring us that there was no way, even if they kept treating the math and all, that because of the brain damage, that there was nothing that could be done. So I wanted to wait until the next, give it another day. Oh, well, I was the one that called the police. <laughs> That morning, that Wednesday morning, when Dr. Akers, he called me before I got there, you know, it was before 7.30, I was getting Megan ready for school. He said, we think this may have been a poisoning, an intentional poisoning, and you need to get the police involved. I'm like, how do I do that, you know? So I said, okay, even though we, that afternoon before, you know, the decision about removing life support. I met the police. They asked me to come back to the house so they could look for possible sources. The specialists have looked at it now said that the amount of diet drinks that he consumed would easily account for the levels of methanol that he had in his body. I think drinking the creatine just kind of must have pushed it over the edge, you know. Um, adulteration of a substance and first degree murder. And the jury um, gave me 20 years on the adulteration and 30 on the murder, and the judge ran them concurrently. We're all human, you know, people are human, and people like to believe that 12 people on a jury found her guilty, so she must be guilty. No way, you know. I mean, I, I have argued that since day one, and I still do not understand what those people could have possibly heard in those testimonies. You read the transcript. What could they have heard that could possibly have convinced them that Diane Fleming could have killed her husband? I included Diane Fleming in my journey because chronic methanol toxicity from aspartame was not considered at all in her case. 
Instead, they chose to prosecute her for supposedly pouring a sealed bottle of blue windshield wiper fluid into Gatorade to poison her husband. While there is no way that I can definitively state the precise or exact cause of my own condition, I did drink six to ten cans of diet soda per day for 20 years, and when my body told me to stop, I eventually got better. I can also state that I have spoken to healthcare professionals who agree with me that aspartame is a probable culprit. When I first embarked upon this journey, a part of me was expecting to return empty-handed. What I uncovered, however, was that the current measures of food safety are failing us. So what do we do today? We drove. <laughs> What would you say to the makers and manufacturers of aspartame now, if you could? I think they owe me a fortune. They owe me an apology. But they owe me a fortune. I live on Social Security Disability. I have nothing left. I'm very heavily in debt. I am trying very hard to start my own business. But that in itself takes money that I don't have. So I'm doing it bits and pieces as I can. But a after that, I mean, just each day was just better and better and better. And I'm still finding things that it's in because they don't label it very well. And that is very, very aggravating um, because you have to read each label. And I've got three kids and everything. And I don't have a whole lot of time to go spending a year and a half in the grocery store to do a week's worth of groceries reading every label that I get my hands on. I've been into chat areas and talked to people with multiple sclerosis and they're very, very hostile to people like me, so I don't tout it too much. All the while, I've learned that uh, there is a very safe uh, sweetener that's an alternative to sugar called Stevia, S-T-E-V-I-A. To this day, the FDA will not allow Stevia to be labeled, advertised, or promoted as a cannot state that. It's just an alternative food supplement.